So to talk about buying a restaurant and taking over an existing business, I'm joined by Radiano Aricali, who's the chairman of Langan's restaurant. Radiano, welcome. How are you? Thank you very well. Thank you for having me. So in your uh, current position, of, you've been purchasing um, businesses, restaurant businesses, uh, with you to increase their value, basically, or mm -hmm. grow them, expand them. Uh, can you tell us what are the advantages of doing that, as opposed to create from scratch uh, a business? Uh, there's there's various sort of advantages. Um, it obviously depends on the strength of the brand that you're acquiring. Um, a good example in that respect would be Langens. Uh, it's a business that was founded by uh, Sir Michael Caine, uh, Peter Langen, and Richard Shepherd. Mm -hmm. So as a as a trio, um, they opened this very large brasserie in, in Mayfair in 1976. Uh, obviously, with Michael Caine's background, his connections to Hollywood, it became a magnet for celebrities and, and it became the first sort of paparazzi restaurant uh, in the UK. Um, you know, that sort of brand building takes decades and Langan's had a heyday between 76 and late 80s, early 90s. Um, and, you know, its star did start to wane after that. Uh, which in itself pre presented a, a, an opportunity, uh, presented value. So when we acquired it in 2020, uh, post, post the pandemic, what we were acquiring was you know, 40 plus years of, of brand building and history. And that, if you want to take the same impact as a business that's been running since 76 and you want to achieve that in 12 months, you, you're spending that's millions. Impossible. You can't yeah. buy, you're buying 40 years of history yeah. and hard work. Yeah, that's, um... and I think especially in a brand like Langan's, um, there's a, a chap called Richard Young, who I, who I know very well from my time in, with the Burley Clubs. He was, he was one of the original paparazzo that used <laughs> to sit on, his, uh, sit on his motorbike outside of Langan's or sit at the bar. And every time someone you know, that he recognized would come in or leave, he would you know, run outside the front door and take a photo of them. So there's actually a, a, a visual record of all of, the, all of the people that have been through the doors at Langan's. And one of my favorite uh, and most, one of his most famous pictures and one of my favorites is Elton John in the late 70s, early 80s, walking up Langans, and, and it was such a lovely brand. It was sort of ramshackle. One, two of the letters on the neon sign were broken. Mm -hmm. So it so said Elgans, and then you've got, <laughs> you've got um, Elton John coming out and, and flicking the V sign at the photographers. And that, that, fo that photograph became iconic. Mm -hmm. And you've got Langans Brasserie in the background. Yes. I mean, that Prices. you can't. You can't recreate that now. Right. So when it when it became available, it was it it was a an opportunity that we can we can pass up. Mm. And I think if you buy brands, you've got to uh, obviously buy brands that are worth buying. But then you've got to then also have an idea of what you're going to do with it afterwards as well. So the people uh, watching these today will think, okay, um, what are the other reasons for for buying? So you describe buying history, mm -hmm. um, sixty years of history. Uh, but you could also buy because you, you already have other companies, uh, other restaurants, and you want to diversify or you want to have synergy. So let's mm -hmm. say, I know before Langans, you already owned restaurants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess for you having an extra brand, possibly some of the people you already hired could also look after that one. So there was mm -hmm. some kind of synergy. Yeah. So what, what, I'm, what I do and what I've been doing for the last four or five years is, is to, uh, so I inherited three brands. Um, so I've got uh, Kix, Kix, you and, and Chucks. So all in the leisure and restaurant uh, business. So we've got members clubs. Uh, we've got uh, rest six Chucks restaurants in West London. Um, so it's an all day dining concepts sort of uh, French, Provencal, Italian uh, cuisine. So we've got Kix, you, which is a group based fitness model. Um, so when I inherited those three businesses as, sort of, as a sort of small unofficial portfolio, mm -hmm. one of the first things I wanted to do is exactly what, what you said and um, restructure the group uh, to take uh, maximum advantage of headcount uh, in the senior roles. So, you know, good senior people are not, not cheap, mm -hmm. um, you know, but you get what you pay for. Uh, but what I found was I had three brands operating in silo mm -hmm. uh, and there's a huge amount of synergy and commonality across the three, the three operations. So uh, very quickly when I, when I took these, these businesses over, I looked at what, what would my ideal head office look like. Mm -hmm. um, what I was very keen to do was have site general managers and, and head chefs or operators that were of a very good standard but would sit in their unit. Mm -hmm. But then I wanted an exec chef across the whole portfolio. I wanted an ops director across the whole portfolio. Likewise with uh, marketing, 
comms, uh, maintenance, finance, uh, and then eventually I, I put an MD level in as well as we added Langens. So that's, that works great, but let's say, so you own Chucks, that's the example, mm -hmm. and you already have a marketing director, um, operation director yeah. and executive chef. So having them looking one extra operation is not, it, it's exactly. a little bit of a stretch, but it's feasible. Yeah. But also suddenly Langens as a new business is benefiting from the whole structure of yeah. an established business. So it really makes a lot of sense. And, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, our, our, our model now is bolt-ons. Yeah. So we'll, we'll buy, so we bought Langens, we bolted it onto the operation, the, 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 the portfolio. Yeah. Yeah. So if you can take a brand that's got legs, but hasn't, hasn't been run properly, and you can then put in the structure we just talked about uh, with the head office, with the marketing team that know what they're doing, with an exec chef that knows how to get quality yeah. at, at, at a, good, a good margin and deliver on all of his mm -hmm. metrics, you then can transform a business into a great idea you know, take it from a great idea into a great business. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, that transition is, is quite tough. There's lots of good ideas. I was going to ask yeah. about the transition. So mm. you inherit from a great brand, but also a clientele that is yeah. used to the mm -hmm. old brand. They don't like changes. You inherit staff who's not necessarily open to new management and yeah. new ways of doing things. Uh, so can you tell us more about the challenges and, and, yeah. and the timeline? Because I think it takes longer than we think to turn around the business. Yes. Well, I think if you're... If you inherit an operating business with a with a team that you you know you, that you need to either get get on board with your vision mm -hmm. or not, uh, you know it's it's a fact of life. Sometimes people aren't willing to change or don't want to come with you on your on your journey. Uh, some people can be very overprotective of a of a legacy brand mm -hmm. and feel like they're the gatekeeper or the protector of of the old way. Mm -hmm. um, and you've got to turn that to your advantage. But then also there comes a point where that's not good for the business. It's sclerotic. Yeah. It slows you down. Um, it prevents you from making the changes that need to happen in order to make the business more successful. Um, and you're right; it takes a lot longer than than people realise. So, if you take a business that's got multiple sort of heads of departments, say, say a larger business uh, with 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 a sort of multifaceted uh, revenue streams. One example is a members club that we, we run. It's got a gym, a restaurant, a spa, uh, club rooms, a whole membership department. That has taken me three and a half years to restructure in the way that I wanted. Um, mm -hmm. And that's a combination of changing the way people work, um, promoting people within into positions where I believe they'll do and deliver what I, what I want from them. Mm -hmm. And then also making some, some changes and having to make some hard decisions. But three and a half years later, we now have a team that is completely on brand, aligned, uh, very much willing to take the business forward. Um, but yeah, it, it, it took a long time. What is the the most expensive, creating a new concept or buying an existing? And I mean, when you're buying and you create something, you create from scratch, so you have to pay the interior designer, the architect, and, mm -hmm. and the research time. When you take over Langen, you're still in the interior designer, but you don't need to find a name, you don't need to spend time in looking for the site, so you save time. And time is money, but overall, what's the most cost-effective buying um, existing or creating? I think it's how it depends on how much change you, you need to make to the brand. So a good example would would be Langen. So, funnily enough, you, you said you know you save time on on the conceptualization, but we actually went through a whole. Yeah. Uh, we we looked at changing the the font of the of the name. Mm -hmm. We looked at changing it to Langen's Mayfair instead of Langen's Brasserie. We almost got rid of the the neon signs out the front because you've. I feel like you put that, you buy that brand, uh, and you you owe it to yourself to leave no stone unturned. Mm. So I find that actually we did probably as much work in in development in a way um, as we would have done if we started from scratch. But we ended up back with <laughs> with the original yeah. anyway, which may sound a bit bizarre, but I think you've got to go through that process yeah. to understand what what to keep and what not to keep. Mm. And there's plenty that we didn't keep, but you know the the iconic yeah. script. The neon signs, all of that was kept, um, but I think that's also a result of the of the strength of the brand as well. Um, there's other brands that I've taken over where I've done a lot less of that work. Um, it's been much more compressed because either I was happy with uh, the brand in terms of its um, conceptualization and its and its sort of you know literally its branding, like mm -hmm. the typeface, the color, the colorways, the concept, everything was was fine. But then also sometimes you buy 
brands that are so young that the strength isn't there anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, you, you haven't bought something that needs to be completely protected because it's such a young brand, you can take it off in a, yep. in a new direction a lot quicker. And is it fair to say that there's less risk? So you buy Langens, worst case scenario, you do as well as they did before. Well, there's, there's, I mean, there are worst you cases. <laughs> you can become an absolute um, yeah, but pariah. You, but you but, already have yeah. you have existing cash flow. Yes. Yeah. So there's already clients coming. Although you are closing for the refurbishment. Yeah. So you have to, you know, you lose your regulars, and you hope they're going to come back after yeah. the refurbishment. But there is already something. There's already yeah. a business. So the risk is is less than if you yeah. were creating from scratch. No, I'd agree with you there. So I think. Um, what, what we had with, with Langens is when we announced that we were reopening it, we, uh, on our website, um, allow people to leave their emails and, and numbers to be contacted for pre-opening and, and you know, parties and, and the launch period. And we had about 25,000 people sign up. Um, and that's, that's exactly what you, you buy. You mm -hmm. buy you know, a, a client book effectively, your customer base. Loyalty. Um, loyalty. loyalty. Mm -hmm. But then also one other thing that play to our strengths as well is that every single person that's ever been to or heard of Langens wants to come and check it out, see what yeah. we've done with it. Have they ruined it? <laughs> Have they made it amazing? Is it as good as it used to be? All of these things. And, and it's incredibly difficult and risky relaunching a legacy brand yeah. like Langens because everybody, you know, Langens meant so many different things to so many different yeah. people. It's where people had birthdays, wedding anniversaries. It's where they went on their first dates. Um, there's a funny story actually when I was driving to the, the site in a cab and it was a building site at the time and I said, oh, can I go to Langens please? And he's like, oh, it's closed, mate. And I said, no, no, we're, we're reopening it. It's in the middle of construction. And he told me on the way to, on the way to Stratton Street that he took his wife on, on their first date uh, to Langens way back in the 80s. And um, he'd always had fond memories of it. So, you know, from a cabbie uh, dropping me off to, you know, Michael Caine and, and all of his entourage, everybody's been through the doors, mm. everybody has an opinion on the business. And so when we relaunched it, everyone wanted to come and have a look uh, at how we were doing. Yeah. So there straight away we had probably I'd say four to six months of, of bookings, like mm. pre-agreed, pre, wow. pre -agreed, um, pre booked because everybody wants to see what we've done. Yeah. So that's a um, very particular example of a super iconic mm. venue yes. that you're taking over. Um, but if we look at all the other aspects that are applicable to all venues, mm -hmm. how about changing dishes? I mean, yep. I'm sure they had a really old school fish pie yep. that everybody loved. But you, you find that in every restaurant. Spinach they are, souffle. They are, they are some really old school <laughs> dishes. I ate so much spinach existed. souffle. Yeah. And um, you want to take it off the menu because it doesn't belong anymore mm. and the, the new vision, the new concept. and it only is, you know, it only caters for a certain segment of the clientele. Mm -hmm. So you want to take it off, but how do you manage that change? Do you, when you take over the business, for example, do you accept the fact that you're going to lose some of the regulars with the change? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, I mean, this is, as you said, applicable to all the brands, but I mean, the easiest sort of examples will be uh, Chucks and Langen. So mm -hmm. with Chucks, it was a very young brand. Um, I was a bit more sort of aggressive with how I wanted the menu to be. Mm -hmm. So I effectively rewrote it with the exec chef um, within three months of, of taking the business on. Um, we could be a lot more, uh, a lot more interventionist in that in that brand because it hadn't established itself for, for, for decades. It was a, a one or two site group that had been running for about three or four years. Mm -hmm. um, and it was slightly confused and didn't really know what it was at the time. And what we wanted to do is get this laser focus on what we're trying to be, who we're trying to serve. Mm -hmm. um, and at what quality standard, what quality level we wanted to operate. Uh, and so in that business, it was a case of we're going to change it. And if 50% of the regulars don't like it, we understand, but this is the direction the business is going in. And we had identified who we wanted to capture moving big, forward. Big decision for so you to make. It is, but it's easier in a, in a, less, yeah. uh, in a less established brand. Yeah. Um, whereas in Langens, we took a menu on uh, that had completely lost its way, but still had classics from the from the 70s and the 80s. In terms of raising the money for the, the purchase of the new restaurant mm -hmm. you targeted, so you say, I want to buy Langans, you would go to your, your the, the private equity fund that backs you and say to the, the, the people, part of the fund, uh, is, uh, assume an investment committee and say, this is the opportunity, I want to buy Langans. What is it that they want to 
you to explain to them yeah. how do you present the opportunity? Well, I, I work in quite a, a sort of a, a streamlined way in the sense I, I deal with sort of one or two people. Mm -hmm. So um, when a when a business you know sort of comes on the radar, first thing we do is our sort of initial sort of sniff test. Is it is it worth looking at? Uh, is it worth spending time on beyond you know a, a very casual look? Um, and we'll have those conversations sort of internally um, with my senior team. Uh, if the answer to that is yes, we then go into more detail with it. Um, at that point, we'll uh, look at things like floor plans, we'll look into the lease, uh, we'll look into uh, the books, if we can get hold of the P&Ls and the, and the trading history of the business. Uh, and we'll do some, some sort of general data gathering. Mm -hmm. um, again, if that then looks still attractive, we then go through with a, a full business model. Um, so you would present actual like a summary that says this is the opportunity, this is the existing, the lease, the floor plan, the business, and this is where I want to take it. Yes, I mean, but that that would be the sort of the, the final. That uh -huh. would be the pitch deck. Yeah. You know, so we'd start off doing all the work behind the scenes, and you know, there's countless times we've done the work, we've got all the way to yeah. preparing a deck, and then we realize actually this is <laughs> this is not going to get this is not going to get through, or we don't believe in it enough, or we're not sure on the opportunity, or the price isn't right, or there's yeah. all sorts of reasons not to not to take something forward. But assuming everything along the way uh, along the way uh, looks good. We'll then put together a, a comprehensive deck, um, and that deck will be, you know, setting out the opportunity, uh, and then there'll be a lot of talk about if we're buying a brand, a lot of talk about the brand, the history of the brand, uh, so that the potential investors can really understand what they're investing in, what they're buying, mm -hmm. uh, especially if the value, if you feel a lot of value is in the, the historical brand, um, and then you'll have a whole lot of historical uh, financial data if you can get hold of it. Um, historical performance, you look at the EBITDA, you look at the conversion, uh, you then try to ascertain points in the P&L where you can make a, a difference as a management team. Mm -hmm. So say you take a restaurant on and you feel the margins are out of line, the labor's out of control, uh, you know, they're, they're not uh, maximizing the footprint of the lease, for example, there could be undeveloped areas mm -hmm. within the business that with a bit of capex and investment uh, could be brought into trading areas. So you do all of that work and then you present a, a business case, which is what you and your team believe you can do with the business. Mm -hmm. And then you uh, ascertain how much money you need. That will be in at the end of the deck. Once you've got, <laughs> every, once you've got everyone interested, you then put the, put the price at the end uh, mm -hmm. as any good salesman should. Uh, but yeah, you, you then have the, have the cost of the opportunity at the back yeah. uh, with, a, with an ROI. Uh, with, with a whole investment. Yeah, exactly. And an exit strategy, your potential exit yeah. uh, uh, purchases may be. So it's um, interesting you mentioned yeah. because when you sell it to an investor, you're selling them, this is how much you're going to spend today uh, yeah. to acquire a, a share in that business. We are planning to sell it in five years yeah. and give you that much return. Yeah. So, if, um, so there's an investment cycle. So you know, you, you need to show them a, a plan. Yeah. So even if it's the best business in the world and you never want to sell it, anyone putting any significant capital into a, into a restaurant business or any sort of business wants to see what a potential exit could look like after three, five years, or or whatever. Or perhaps there is no exit after three or five years. Perhaps at three or five years you've established the brand, you've strengthened it it's completely primed for growth and then you take another round of funding and then you take it to you yeah. know 15 sites 20 sites and then maybe the exit mm -hmm. is then uh, the so it could be 10 years later the, you're factoring in you're planning your exit from the very beginning yeah and, and i think i think you have to because as restaurateurs we're passionate we we love operating businesses and i think you know if we if you and i were honest with ourselves as restaurateurs if we had a, a business we loved that made money why would we ever sell yeah. it? You know, you, you, you fall in love with your businesses. You put so much of your personality and your energy and your time into them that the thought of selling it mm. before you've even opened it isn't totally natural for a, for a restaurateur. But you've also got to think like an investor and an investor will not put money into something unless they can understand what a potential exit How looks like. Sell it. Yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier some elements of the, the research you do prior to buying the business. Mm -hmm. Um, so you do an initial, you know, research and then you go into a due diligence at some point. Um, you go into what we call due diligence, which is a lot more in-depth research mm -hmm. and um, you look into the, the, 
the employees, you look into the possible HR case down mm -hmm. there, you look into creditors, if any debt, yep. uh, you look into when is the lease due for mm -hmm. rent review. Um, so what are, if you can go through all the various points, yeah. how long does it take and, and what are the points you look into? Um, well, it, it's sort of, I, I know it's not the, the, the best answer, but it takes as long as it takes. So due deal or DD or, or whatever we call it, um, it's, you know, it has to be done. You know, the, the more time and effort you put into due diligence, uh, the less nasty shocks and surprises you have later on. But to be honest, you, you can never, you know, you can never completely, you know, DD the risk out of anything completely. Um, but the things you want to sort of concentrate on are the, are the big things, you know, sort of any, any major sort of outstanding debts, any issues in terms of health and safety, outstanding cases. Um, you know, you could buy a business and find that it's halfway through settling a, an issue with an employee that's, you know, fallen down the stairs, you know, two years ago or whatever. So that's, that's your kind of basic due deal. And then you've got, I, I always and learned the hard way, you know, having been burnt at varying degrees over the years, but the lease is always critical. Uh, understanding the landlord, uh, the relationship of the previous occupier with the landlord, um, the relationship of the business with its neighbors and the local community, mm -hmm. um, understanding conditions on the license. It's amazing how many people will buy a, a business or take on a, a lease and not read the conditions on the, on the liquor license, for example. Um, various businesses have quite onerous uh, conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, have to stop trading at certain times, have to clear terraces by certain times, can't serve alcohol with breakfast, uh, can't have standing drinking, what they call vertical drinking. No alcohol with breakfast. Yeah, that's, I mean, I know it's, <laughs> it's crazy. I don't know where these people, how these people live, but yeah. Um, so you can often sort of forget about those things and the excitement of, of pursuing a target, but you know, that's the sort of boring yep. nitty gritty that, that absolutely must be done. Um, yep. Likewise with, with HR, you've got to look at maybe even pension liabilities and certain uh, like, you know, very old businesses. Um, you might be inheriting or buying you know, large problems and, and you need to be fully aware of what's going on before, yep. before you actually complete on, on the deal because once, once it's done, that's, that's your problem then um, and you'll have to deal with it. In terms of handover, so you bought the restaurant and now you got the keys, you need to organize a handover from the previous team to the new team. Uh, how do you like to, um, to organize that? Uh, I think it, it, there's, there's sort of two sort of purchases, aren't there? There's you purchase a going concern or you purchase uh, a business that's, that's closed and doesn't, doesn't have a team or staff or isn't trading. So in the case where there's an existing team, you need to very quickly understand who's operating the business, who's running it who's the responsible person for licensing, for health and safety. So there's all sorts of um, regulatory uh, things that you, you, you have to get abreast of very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, the minute you take the keys, as you said, that all of that becomes your problem. Mm -hmm. um, you can't sort of blame, blame so the guy before. You would negotiate that with the, the current yeah. owner and say, I want your team to hand over properly to us. Yeah, I think that when, when you buy a business, you buy the, you know, effectively buy the employees as well. So um, in several uh, larger purchases, um, especially multi-site purchases with senior people in, there's often a, a you know, a period of time where senior, senior members of the team are incentivized to stay for a certain period with the new, mm -hmm. uh, with the new ownership. Uh, also, you get people that are, um, you know, sort of shareholders or got uh, LTIP plans mm -hmm. uh, that are in larger groups. And so part of the condition of the sale might be that those people have to remain with the business for six months, a year or, or however long in order to, mm -hmm. in order to fully realize their, their equity uh, or benefits within the business. So we talk, we spoke about the, uh, yeah, the, 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 sorry, the license, the mm -hmm. health and safety, the going concern to uh, uh, HR. Mm -hmm. um, what about, you know, introduction to regulars? That yep. could be something you want the Metro D to introduce to the new manager, all the regulars. Yep. And I think also, you know, you, you've got to make sure that in the, in the sale process, you're, you know, very uh, acutely aware of who the assets are in the business. So for example, that's a great example. So you've got a maitre d' that's been in the business five years or 10 years, knows everyone, everyone loves him or her, and then you buy the business and they hand their notice and then leave. I mean, that's not, that's, that's suboptimal. You're going to, you're going to <laughs> going to end up uh, losing, losing an asset, you know, yeah. uh, in that person. And so during the purchase process, you, you would, you would have conversations uh, with, with the previous ownership, 
if appropriate and possible, uh, you would try and secure that maitre d', put them on an on a incentive package or, or, or something like that. Make sure they understand that they're important to the business, their role is secure. So, you know, often when you buy businesses, if, you, if you're buying a going concern, you need to very quickly understand who, who the, the main players are in the business, who the, who the star performers are, mm -hmm. and ensure that they're happy and retained uh, post-purchase because you can have a huge amount of value walk out of a business. Um, post-purchase if, if you haven't locked those people down. So before we finish the, um, this uh, episode, is there anything you wanted to add? Any final thoughts? Um, yeah, I just think it'd be good to, to add that, you know, buying a brand isn't, isn't a sort of, you know, a, an automatic win or a slam dunk. You know, you, could, you can buy good brands as well as bad. Uh, you can buy uh, businesses that need a lot more work than you ever thought, and that's where your due diligence comes into play. Um, but at the same time, if you buy the right brand with, the, with, with good strength and depth and history, uh, it can be incredibly rewarding as well as, you know, it can, it can also set yourself up for, for success. And if you, if you treat the brand with respect and take it forwards and improve it, you can, you can do great things. Great. Thank you very much. Absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me.